that the city even entertain developers' projects that are as much as 40% more height than is allowed by our own community plan, in addition to other substantial violations. Why not require developers to submit plans in compliance? That's a great question. I really wish we could say no to every application that came in that didn't meet our plans. Unfortunately, under California law, um, you basically can't eliminate someone's ability to request a variance or an exception from the rules. So in other words, if you want to build a high rise in a single family zone, you can ask. You'll never get it, but you can ask. And unfortunately, the system we have, we have to analyze those projects. So many times people come to us angry that, hey, they're proposing this massive project next to my house. How can they do that? Well, they can propose almost anything they want. They could ask to put a landfill on top of City Hall if they want to. Um, the, yeah, <laughs> in some cases. <laughs> um, so the rules require us to analyze those projects. The good news is the findings we have to make, we have to look to those plans for guidance. And in many times, they don't fit within those plans. Unfortunately, land use in Los Angeles is a political process, and it goes up to your elected officials. And that's where groups like this and your collective voice really do have an impact. I haven't seen a project approved yet where the council chambers is filled with people concerned about it. Normally they listen to those people very loudly um, and very intently. But basically when we see projects like that that are 40% over what's allowed in the plans, um, us as your stewards of land use, look at those projects very skeptically. We look at what the regulations are. Now there are some areas in the city that are very out of date zoning. So for example, downtown Los Angeles, it's treated the same way the valley is in many areas. So if you want to put a high rise on Grand Avenue where we want a high rise, you have to go through a process that sounds like you're trying to do brain surgery, but at the end of the day, it's what we want you to build is a high rise on Grand Avenue. And so there's some cases that you may see that where the zoning is so antiquated and old um, that we haven't kept up with updating those zones. But in many cases, when you see something 40% over what's allowed, it's just flat out they can ask for it, but in many cases they won't get it. Uh, Marshall Long asks, he's not here, but he asked, what is your view of the Ventura Boulevard specific plan and its enforcement? I think it's a great plan. Like any specific plan, it's really a snapshot in time from uh, many people probably worked on that plan in this room. It was really to, cur to curtail the growth of all the commercial development and office that was going in along Ventura. Um, it's been used for other purposes since then. I think it's had a really good benefit. I do think there are some issues that could be updated in the plan. I think we need to look a little closer how residential fits in that area. We've had some large projects that have been able to combine lots that I think kind of got around the intent of the plan. Um, but like any plan, I think every once in a while we have to evaluate it and make sure it still meets the, um, the goals and the objectives it started out with and kind of learn from what we have in place. But to be careful not to open something up that could actually be um, allowed to be changed in a way that wouldn't be effective. Uh, Ellen Vukovic asks, what is your position on opening up the Ventura Boulevard specific plan? And secondly, are you aware that a group representing the interests of all the communities under the plan met and voted against opening up the plan? Um, no, I'm not aware of that meeting. Um, but definitely we look to the people who live by that plan and see what their interests are, whether or not they want to evaluate it or not. Um, there's a way to study things without opening them up. We can do, you know, um, a study with our staff, a field level study, work with community groups. Even some um, homeowners associations have done their own studies and come back to us and said, here's some of the pressures we're seeing, here's some of the issues, here's some of the out of data items. Um, so I'm not a big fan of adding on work programs and opening up a plan where people aren't interested in opening it up. We have plenty of work to do in the city and plenty of areas of plan. So if there's not a consensus from the community to open up, I wouldn't see any reason why we would take that on. Follow-up question by Ellen Vukovic is, uh, the city attorney has advised that if the Ventura Boulevard specific plan is opened up, uh, any interest can participate and make suggestions that could threaten the viability of the entire plan. Is that your understanding? I think everyone has a voice at the table, um, but to say by evaluating something it would threaten it, I'm not sure it's quite um, that clear cut. Um, again, I haven't heard any um, discussions or any high-level um, need to really investigate opening up that plan. So, um, cellular communication facilities are discretionary action where we have what's called a conditional use permit where we evaluate the areas and working with the carriers and telling them 
you know, there's certain places for this infrastructure, and there's also places they should avoid, and making sure they understand that's been helpful. Sharon Landler asks, and I don't know if this is in your jurisdiction or not, how do restaurants get to take over sidewalks? Do they need permits? Uh, if so, are the permit requirements enforced? Good idea. Yeah, it's actually with the Board of Public Works, the Bureau of Engineering um, handles that, but I have a little information on that. It's called a revocable permit. So they have to get permission to encroach upon the sidewalk. Um, the unfortunate part, there's actually a council motion we're looking at this, is when someone adds sidewalk dining, which in some areas, like on Ventura, is very attractive. It, it adds for a vibrancy, kind of a public area. With the weather we have in Los Angeles, it's nice to have a coffee out on the sidewalk enjoying the sun. The problem becomes we don't provide parking for those tables. We have some restaurants in the Fairfax area that have more seats outside than they do inside. And that's where we start to see a problem where our parking regulations haven't caught up with those rules. And we actually have some current legislation we're working on that will hopefully kind of put, shed some light on that. Uh, Lisa David asked a question concerning uh, cul-de-sacs. Is it once it was that in your jurisdiction? And she said that 90% of the homeowners on a particular street have signed a petition to make a cul-de-sac. Uh, uh, is this within your jurisdiction? And uh, how? What uh, happened? Yes, not usually an item that comes to planning, unless it's like a new project you're building in the hills. Uh, the, Imagine like in some um, area that has vacant land and you're putting in a new infrastructure in a cul-de-sac and street system, then it would fall under our subdivision powers and the planning process. But if you have a cul-de-sac or you're trying to close off to privatize a road, it would actually go through the Bureau of Engineering. My suggestion would be to work with your local council office and they can kind of put you in touch with people you need to know. Many times people want to gate their streets and do different things like that. We try and discourage that because um, it does have a perception of creating but there's a crime perception in the area when you do that. Um, but again, I'd suggest working with your local council office. And another question, Ray Langford asks about the crossings between the light rail, the busways, and the, uh, the streets. And one says that these are accidents waiting to happen. Uh, what can be done about that? Well, we're finally at the table in the planning department with um, the MTA. In the past, the MTA would put the blue line system in, the red line system in, and we'd be an afterthought. Now we're meeting with them early on. They're actually funding some planning on for the new um, connect regional connectors and the new stations going in to make sure that those stations fit within the communities they go within. If you look at the blue line, for example, right by the convention center, you step off, you automatically are into a secondary highway. The second you step off the train, you have to cross a busy road, wait for the light, and cross four parking lots to get to our convention center. That's no way to greet visitors and conventioners that are going to the convention center or visiting Staples Center. Um, one of the things we're trying to do is make sure that MTA works with the planning department so that those stations that come within our neighborhoods fit within the context of Los Angeles. Um, make sure that they really are sensitive, that we want wide sidewalks, safe ways for pedestrians to navigate. We want to make sure they're ADA compliant. We also want to make sure that they have appropriate lighting, that they actually architecturally fit within the style of homes that we see in that area, the style of businesses, rather than kind of a cookie cutter system that we see. And Bob Anderson asked, and you've answered part of the question, you want to know what are your and the department's plans to prioritize and allocate work on ordinances such as the code simplification ordinance? So they can be developed, vetted with the public, and implemented on a reasonable schedule. Yeah, we we have a code study section that includes six people um, that we work on many of the legislation. Um, hillside nationalization is something that we would be working on. Um, we we're also working on many ordinances to kind of update our antiquated zoning code that really hasn't been comprehensively updated since 1946. And so um, within that unit, we also came up with a policy so that we can engage better with neighborhood groups, that we would, any time we propose a new citywide ordinance, we make sure that it gets to you 60 days before it goes to our planning commission. That way you have time to go through your own planning committees, um, your own land use committees, your full board of directors, so they can take an action and get that back to us. It works for neighborhood groups like you, as well as neighborhood councils, so that we're able to hear your input, rather than having to surprise you, you have to come down to city hall and say, hey, we haven't heard about this, we have a continuance, 
um, for 30 days. We can go back to our group and get their consensus on this item. Um, so we're really trying to make sure that we get your input in early in the process. And that's one of the things we're doing to prioritize our items is making sure that when we move quickly, we're not moving so quickly that we can't gain consensus on these items. Uh, Marshall Wall asks, why have there been no public hearings on the proposed changes to the planning department procedures? Yeah, I probably need a little information about what procedures we're changing um, that have been having information on, but um, in terms of the zoning code, um, there was some misinformation that we haven't been doing a lot of outreach, so we halted what we were doing and went out and did five additional public workshops. Um, unfortunately, we did these public workshops, we had about five people to ten people show up each one of them. Um, we still held them and got the information out and, you know, had more additional time. That was one of the things that drove this policy, that we wanted to make sure that we got the up-to-date email list for people, that we know people's current addresses, and we can let them know the things that we're doing in the planning department so they can come to us and get engaged and give us our ideas. There's nothing worse than going to your legislative body, whether it's the planning commission, and Mr. Epstein sees us and we have 20 people who say, I haven't heard about this yet, and we've been working on the ordinance for over a year. So we're really trying to make sure we get to the right people who want to engage with us and get their input early on. I have before me a Los Angeles Times uh, story dated July 23rd, 2010. And the headline is, Villaragosa, Villaragosa chooses City Hall veteran as planning chief. That's you. And in the article, there's a quote. Part of the reason for a change in leadership in the planning department is to make sure we drive all aspects of planning, including community plans, further, faster, and more aggressively than have been done. And the question is, is this being done, and what is the schedule for community plans? Was that his quote? Who do you think was, yeah, you can tell him you're right. Awesome Buehner, our first chief deputy. Um, yeah, that was one of the main reasons was um, the mayor was very frustrated that we had our community plan program hasn't been adopted in a number of years. We got a lot of people excited about it, but when it came time to actually get those plans to our planning commission, they weren't coming quick enough. Um, and he had some really good ideas about that. He was actually correct on that issue. And part of what we found out was we were challenging our staff with too many things on their plate. We're asking them to review large high-rises downtown like LA Live and at the same time work on the Hollywood Community Plan. So what we've done is we've kind of created a firewall. We've given those people specific projects like the Community Plan Updates, given them the right amount of resources, and told the council they can't steal those resources back from us. That they dedicate these to our planning program, we gotta keep them there until we finish those plans. And like I talked about earlier, we you know, fought to keep that million dollars, but basically not rolling over for the whim of the day to use the money for something else and making sure that we have secure funds to continue our planning process and be more aggressive and vocal about the importance of that. So we have five plans right now going through the process. Um, we have Studio City, um, sorry, not Studio City, we have Granada Hills is going through the process currently, Silmar, um, we also have South LA, Southeast LA, um, and West Adams currently going through the Hollywood Community Plan. It's probably the closest one that will be coming through. And then we'll be taking on a few more plans right after that. Um, really focusing around where the new transit investment's going. And, but we're still doing many plans in the neighborhood that's short of a community plan. In some areas, a community design overlay to make sure that we have consistent architecture and well-designed projects going through. We're also going through and adding new specific plans in certain areas. We're also doing different overlays to make certain areas more pedestrian friendly and have traffic kind of slow down in certain areas where we've seen some accidents happen. With that, before we ask you, uh, what? yeah, please clean up. Please come forward to speak with the Michael if you have any individual questions. Look forward to seeing you next month. We're going to be discussing in part the new Coliseum that's being built for the new NFL football team in downtown Los Angeles. Not a done deal. Maybe. Maybe, yeah. Maybe. Maybe is right. Thank you for coming. No, not maybe.